But the final statement came from the government spokesman, William Graham, who was the, uh, the trade minister. The Soviets are conducting a very interesting and remarkable social experiment, economic experiment, and they deserve to be allowed to continue without outside interference, and we will give them every support that we can. That about almost two million people in work camps. Utterly appalling. Uh, to my mind, one of the most shameful speeches that's ever been made in the House of Commons. Today in British Thought Leaders, I sit down with historian Giles Udi, whose work covers Soviet history, the Gulag, and the influence of Soviet communism on British politics. Giles is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and has written for publications including The Times, Daily Mail, and The Daily Telegraph. I'm Lee Hall and this is British Thought Leaders. Charles Udi, thanks for joining us on British Thought Leaders. My pleasure. So you're an expert not just on uh, communism's influence on, on British history, but also on the Soviet history itself. That's but right. Before we get into your new book, can you tell us a bit about what communism is and how it, how it looked in the Soviet times? Is it the same as socialism? Well, I certainly can. Um, if you go back to Marx, who was the inspiration for Soviet communism and the Russian Revolution, you see that he basically um, held two particular hypotheses. Marxism was a utopian philosophy, uh, which looked towards creation, creating a virtual heaven on earth. I think at one point Marx actually used that phrase, um, very resonant of the Bible. He was brought up, in fact, with a conventional Christian faith, although his father was Jewish. Um, Marxism held two particular hypotheses about property and history. The first thing was that property and property ownership was essentially the, the root of all evil. And that uh, over the course of time, you had been able to see how owning property corrupted people, corrupted systems and whatever. And therefore, his answer to that was the abolition of private property, which would eventually turn into full communism. Added to that, he had a theory about history. And the theory was that because property holding was at the root of all evil, there was over the course of history a series of conflicts, like a, a, a constant revolving conflict between the classes, the property owning classes and those who held no property, and that you could trace this through history. And that now in his time, and we're talking about the 1850s and onwards, the Communist Manifesto was 1848, you can at that particular time, um, he could see that uh, we were heading for what he thought was the final conflict. The final conflict was going to between, be between the proletariat, the working class, because they owned no property, they were morally pure and their motives couldn't be questioned, and capitalists who owned property. And of course, because capitalists owned property, everything they did was designed to protect that property. So the, the legal system was utterly corrupt. It was all biased in favor of the capitalist um, middle class, bourgeois, and, uh, uh, and therefore everything needed to be overturned. So his answer was revolution. Now, as far as socialism is concerned, socialism as he saw it, socialism as Lenin saw it, and Lenin actually described it as such, and socialism, which after all um, became the name of the new Soviet state, um, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, socialism was the intermediate stage between that, uh, the start of that revolution and the final arrival of this heaven on earth, communism, when uh, the all necessity for any state control would disappear, everyone would simply be full of brotherhood and, uh, and philanthropy and whatever else. So socialism was the, the period when the working class would rise up, the dictatorship of the proletariat, that famous phrase, the working class would rise up and they would take all of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. That's basically everything from, from factories to banks. Uh, they would take that over, uh, they would become the new owners of it, but of course, because they were non-property owners, effectively, they would not be tainting it because it was simply now held by the people en masse. They would wrest that from the capitalist bourgeois bit by bit by bit and uh, then they would rule as a dictatorship 
and somehow or other, and Marx was never really very clear about this, neither was Lenin, it was more a matter of optimism and hope than fact, although everyone claimed it was scientific theory, then gradually that would morph into this great heaven on earth, this communism. So that's what socialism is. Now socialism has been used since then to describe many different systems. There's a lot of confusion in people's minds because socialism is not the same as social democracy. People look at the, the, the Scandinavian uh, states, uh, nations, and, and they, they, they say, ah, oh, well, they're socialist. Actually, they're not. They're social democratic. And the key difference is that social democracy believes that capitalism can be tempered and you can take legal measures in order to be able to keep it humane so that you can look after those less fortunate in your, your nation. That's social democracy. That's very different. That's, that's, that's like Tony Blair's Labour Party. However, socialism has as its essential component the taking over of those means of production, distribution and exchange uh, by force. Uh, and therefore, many, many people who think that they uh, would like to espouse socialism today, if they're talking about real socialism, as Marx and as Lenin laid it out, and later on, obviously, in communist China too, if they're talking about that, then they need to be aware that violence is integral to that. It's impossible to take all these things without taking them by force, which would mean uh, punishing, imprisoning, uh, whatever, to those who don't want to give their property up. You visited the remains of uh, the gulags in very isolated parts of Russia and researched a lot of uh, testimonies from survivors of the gulags. Could you paint a picture for us of what life was like in these Soviet gulags? Yeah, the, the, the ones I've particularly visited are in the Siberian Arctic, if you draw a straight line, all the way from Afghanistan, right north, you get to the Arctic Circle, 300 miles further north, uh, and the settlement, it's something that I have a long-term writing project about. The settlement there sits on one-third of the, the world's reserves of nickel. Uh, there was no possibility of it being able to exploit it until you had a supply of disposable labour. Temperatures there go down to minus 50 centigrade in winter, six weeks of dark, um, all the way over Christmas and, uh, and January. Um, incredibly difficult conditions. The road system runs out 800 miles further south. The only way in was either by very primitive aeroplane, and of course prisoners wouldn't be taken by that, or by barge, a two-week barge journey north down one of the, the, the longest rivers in the world, where when you finally get off, again, about 300 miles from the, the ocean, you, the river is still a mile wide, and then a hike 80 miles inland. So conditions in somewhere like that were absolutely brutal. Uh, over the life of just those camps, uh, 300,000 people probably went through there and, uh, and were left there. There would be maybe um, officers from the, 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 the Baltic army who were taken by the Soviets, um, captured when the Soviets moved into the Baltic states. They would be taken there. Uh, their relatives wouldn't know what had happened to them. They would not know if they were going to survive. And the equivalent distance for, from, say, from Latvia as uh, Cairo to Durban enormous, enormous uh, distances. So all the way across the Soviet Union, there were maybe as many at, at, at its height of, of a thousand gulag camps. Uh, there would have been maybe 18 million people that would have gone through those camps, with a further 10 million who would have been deported under arms, either from occupied nations or internally displaced, where they'd literally be taken away from their homes at a moment's notice. Uh, and of, of, of that 28 million, perhaps perhaps 3 million plus or minus 100,000 or 200,000 probably died. But of course, before you ever got to the gulag, arrest might be followed simply by execution. Uh, and there we have many hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people, more uh, or almost entirely innocent uh, in the great terror years of 1837 to 38. The NKVD, the secret police, shot 680,000. Um, but, but then again, the other sorts of figures here we're talking about are during World War II, the Soviet authorities shot 157,000 of their own servicemen and women for military crimes. Um, it, it was a very, very brutal period, a brutal state, and uh, life in the Gulag was grim. The, you could be there for five, ten, 
25 years was a, was a, was a maximum sentence. And, um, and even after you got out, if you survived, the emotional damage, the emotional trauma uh, of what you'd been through would be, be extreme. Uh, and we have to think of, of a nation where so many millions of people have been uh, thrown into jail for many years, uh, middle of nowhere, hardly able to correspond, uh, and they've been through this brutalization where they're literally treated as slave labor and are of no uh, essential importance at all, simply there to service the state and build the great Soviet, uh, um, the great Soviet dream of, of, of full communism, which never came. And um, they'd come out, they'd find in some cases that actually their family had rejected them because they still didn't believe they were innocent. In other cases, um, they were so broken that they were unable to relate uh, as balanced human beings, and they'd maybe have family, bring up children. Uh, those families, again, would be damaged by the, um, the mental damage that, that former prisoners had suffered. Physical damage, extreme, a lot of malnutrition. I mean, they controlled their prisoners entirely by hunger. So you, you, you add all that together, and, and, and Russia today still lives under the legacy of that because Damaged children growing up in damaged homes themselves become damaged parents. So you've now got the grandchildren's generation. Uh, and while there may not be many gulag survivors still left because the, the camps officially closed in the 1950s, of course the prison system continued fairly brutally and, and, and grew or, or shrunk in numbers in all the years since then. But, but nonetheless, that, that's, that's the legacy the country lives with today, which it's never come to terms with. In the, the uh, remains that you visited, the, the nickel mines, etc., were related to the gulags, the people were there working on those kinds of things? Yes, they were. They were. Um, they were sent down to mine. It's a very interesting site geologically because they have nickel and copper, cobalt, which was needed. Um, nickel was needed for strengthening uh, steels, so um, the very handcuffs they were put in would be uh, nickel plated, but you know, toughening tank steel and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, they also had, um, they found coal there because of course they were far too far away from anything. So they had their own coal mines uh, 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 and there was even one mine, mining clay so they could build bricks. Everything, everything was, was built within that city. And the city is still there now. It's still a modern city. It's, it's owned by oligarchs um, and still produces the most fabulous wealth. But, um, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's an extraordinary place. I, and I think most remains of gulag camps have not survived because they were wooden barracks. Uh, the, the barbed wire where you see it is now rusting and lying close to the soil, though occasionally you'll find a converted oil barrel, which is a stove from, from the barrack building. Uh, there is one building there which I have visited, which is the internal cell block, punishment cell block of a punishment camp. Uh, every, um, Norilsk, which is the particular group of camps I'm talking about, may, may be a, at any time would have had 10, 15 different camps, different work camps, you know, one by a cement factory, one somewhere else, one close to this, another one just as a building at a brick factory, you know. And, um, but if you, if you, got into trouble or misbehaved, you'd be put in the camp lock up in your individual camp. But if, if it was a worse infraction, and sometimes it could simply be invented, you were taken off to a penal camp. There was one in a settlement just a few miles outside the city. And then within that, for those who then still wouldn't bow the knee to the system, there was a punishment block. And this punishment block is quite extraordinary. That does remain because it was built in concrete, and I've been there. The cells, um, uh, some of them are open to the elements. So you're locked in one of those, you freeze, or you're eaten in the summer uh, by all the flies. Uh, and then um, uh, the doors are studied, so you can't bang to get out. Uh, there's another one which is completely dark, so you're locked in there in absolute darkness all day long. Um, you, you see the refinement that there is of the deliberately designed cruelty and brutality. And you ask yourself, what kind of mind thinks of these things? What kind of mind designs this level of torture? And you're faced with an extraordinary um, view of human nature, which is far from pleasant. 
I think we're seeing it today. We're seeing it today in the, in the, in the war in Ukraine. We're coming face to face with things which uh, a generation or two brought up in the comparative peace we've known in Europe haven't known exists. We, all, we, we thought maybe they were an exception and, you know, they finished in 1945. Actually, history has shown that they are a constant um, from the dawn of civilization and they continue today, tragically. And I think we have to probably be aware of that and we have to take into account those things and not be over optimistic in our view of other countries and other systems, particularly if they are totalitarian in any way and not particularly democratic. So your new book, um, Labour and the Gulag, Russia and the Seduction of the British Left. Um, so it's talking about the connection between the Soviet communism yeah, and the Labour Party in Britain <coughs> at the time. So the, the Russian Revolution happened in 1917 and the Labour Party at the time welcomed that. They absolutely did. They absolutely did. So you need to go back a little bit earlier than the revolution in 1917. The Labour Party was founded as a socialist party. But in those days, socialism was, was a dream. It was a, it was a theoretical uh, political philosophy, uh, influenced very much by Marx. And so they were looking at Marx as the inspiration and, um, and full communism as being the final outcome. Socialism, they, they said in writing, was the way to get there. Now, uh, there, had, there was no socialist state. There was no communist revolution anywhere. Uh, Keir Hardy, the founder of the Labour Party in 1910, we're talking now seven years before the revolution, had talked in glowing terms about Marx as one of the greatest inspirations of the working class, who had shown that the way to achieve socialism was the organization of the working class as a single unit to be able to take over the means of production, distribution, and exchange. And he had actually declared that the Labour Party's aim was to build that coalition in order to be able to wrest capital from the capitalists. Those are his own words in 1910, before the revolution. So when the revolution came, they were seeing their dreams actually fulfilled, something they had just got together and, and said, maybe one day this could happen. They were actually seeing it happening before them. And of course, the information that they got in those days with the lack of news was, was limited. But as far as they were concerned, this was it, one of the most exciting moments in history. Ramsay MacDonald, 1919, who was a Labour leader, um, the Labour leader, although he, he lost favour very much in the 1930s, he was one of the big, big figures of the interwar Labour Party and the first Labour Prime Minister. And the, 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 a Labour Prime Minister of the first two Labour administrations in government. Ramsay MacDonald called it one of the greatest events in history and said that uh, Lenin's cause was the cause of the British workers. Um, others in the party, senior members of the party, welcomed it and also made it quite clear that they would be very hostile to any attempts by the British government to in any way oppose it. So you've got that. The, the Russian Revolution was welcomed openly by the British Labour Party, who had set itself up in order to be able to see that socialist revolution take place in England. A, a, a lot of people uh, talk about how the Labour Party was founded more in Methodism than in Marx, which I, I've shown in my book. I, I, I've got a chapter nearly on it, and it's too too detailed to go into here. Actually, is is really a fiction. It's it's repeated constantly to the point where everyone believes it's true. But if you actually look into it, you find that it is not nearly true. And Marx was a much stronger influence on the early members of the party. Now, what's happened since then, obviously, is a different history. But that was. That was what was at the root of all of this. And therefore, that determined their response to uh, Russian or Soviet repression, imprisonment, um, uh, right through uh, uh, into Stalin's time and all of his brutal repression. Uh, they, they excused, turned a blind eye to, or simply didn't believe because they'd, they'd invested so much emotionally in this being the answer to British politics, but, but a whole purpose in their lives. How could they suddenly turn their back on it and say, we've been following a philosophy which is actually bankrupt? So do they want a revolution to happen here similarly to what happened in Russia? They did indeed. They did indeed. And, and this is where you actually need to, you need to be able to see there were all sorts of nuances in this. 
As, as the <clears throat> 1920s progressed, as so often happens, when radicals come into government, they find that their, um, their extremism needs to be tempered to reality. So the Labour Party um, uh, at cabinet level realised that they weren't going to be able to get a violent revolution uh, started and off the ground. Uh, so they talked about uh, gradual socialism coming in by common consent. Now, practically speaking, that would never happen. No one is going to give up their property. No one is going to give up their factory voluntarily. But they never got past that particular hurdle. And then, uh, you know, the Second World War came along. So, so the Labour Party split it, 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 in terms of its grasping of that issue. It, it, it didn't split so much. It perhaps diverges. Is, is, there were different views about what might happen. But it never tempered uh, their support for Stalin and for what Lenin was doing before him. So they remained wholeheartedly behind what was happening in Russia. They just excused it as maybe being necessary to overthrow what they all said was a very, very brutal regime, unaware of the fact that actually an equally brutal regime, or far more brutal, in fact, was taking its place. By 1929, 12 years later, the news of uh, Stalin's gulags was, was coming to Britain. Uh, how did the Labour Party react to that? It certainly did, and the Labour Party's reaction, they came into government in 1929. The Labour Party's reaction to it was really quite extraordinary. Again, there was this belief that, that Soviet communism had to be pursuing their own goal. So their response was uh, disbelief, uh, prevarication, trying to avoid, it, it, privately in cabinet, they knew what was going on. The cabinet minutes which I've managed to uncover show that they were fully aware that Britain, um, which was then importing a million tons of timber from gulag camps in the northwest of Russia, uh, a value maybe today of 500 million pounds a year, we were the biggest customer of the Soviets. Um, I should probably explain in a minute quite how those camps came into being. But um, the, 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 the Russian, uh, sorry, the, the Labour cabinet um, was faced with a problem. They knew what was going on, but the Conservatives and the British churches were clamouring for a public inquiry. So they found every way they possibly could of diverting from that. They blocked any opportunity for a, a debate in the House of Commons. Interestingly enough, it was the undemocratic House of Lords in which this became a very, very big issue because there was no government control there and people could raise the subject and, and, and there was constant debate and mention of it. But um, I think probably I need to backtrack on exactly what was going on in the northwest of Russia because that's, that's really the key thing, to understand the... Uh, the, the the extremity uh, and moral compromise the Labour government took part in by denying it, you have to go back to what actually had happened. And in 1929, Stalin authorised the deportation of 1.8 million uh, kulak, small holding peasants, uh, a lot of them from Ukraine, also from other parts of Russia, as his attempt to eradicate uh, private property holding, because private property was forbidden under communism, uh, and so was private trading. So just to ask you, sorry to interrupt, but the deportation area doesn't mean out of Russia, it has a different meaning in this oh, context. Oh, indeed, it, indeed it does, indeed it does. This is loading 1.8 million people at a few hours notice into cattle cars and deporting them to the far northwest of Russia and to Siberia. 250,000 men, women and children, elderly women, young children, were deported up to the northwest of Russia. That's the area around the White Sea, which is sort of the sea that borders Scandinavia. They were then all put in camps. I mean, it, it was absolute bedlam because it was, this was a really isolated part of Russia. There was no way that, that they could have received that number of deportees, even at, at, at a few months' notice, or, or a year or two's notice, rather, let alone a few months. So 250,000 people dumped, some children even without shoes. And we're talking now here about the ex an extremely cold part of the world where the men were put to work and the men were put to work to cut timber in order to be able to provide foreign income uh, for the Russian economy. 
This was the way uh, Russia wanted to earn money because it realized it could undercut almost every other nation. It was using free slave labor and uh, timber was, was, was needed. Pit props, we had a vast coal industry in those days, um, uh, doors, all, all sorts of things. So ships flocked up to the White Sea, British ships, a lot of British ships, to be loaded with timber. Uh, loaded with timber, cut by slave laborers. The conditions there were appalling. There were examples where uh, stowaways would be found on board British ships, taken uh, ashore and shot in front of sailors. The sailors would see what went on. But actually in the camps themselves, uh, sometimes uh, they had to build the crudest shelters just out of logs and, and bits of turf in between. It's reckoned that 21,000 mostly children died of malnutrition and disease in the first year alone. Now, of those 1.8 million, 30,000 were shot before they ever got to the trains, the so-called worst dangerous ones. So we've got these people living in appalling conditions. Of that 1.8 million, maybe a quarter of a million were dead within about three or four years. And you've got these appalling conditions. You've got stowaways gradually making their way to the northwest uh, ports of Britain. And, uh, and with them, the stories came out. The stories started to circulate. Uh, some managed to escape to Finland. The British ambassador in Finland got signed uh, affidavits from these people, then forwarded them to uh, the prime minister and the foreign secretary. They saw them. We have records that they saw all these things. So they knew what was going on. But uh, there was a massive uh, PR campaign, if you like to put it in modern terms. We had government ministers outright denying what was going on, saying it was all a pack of lies uh, produced to be able to take down the Labour government, uh, and that in fact prisoners weren't used on the timber trade uh, that was for export. And uh, in any case, and, and perhaps the most Perhaps the most devious excuse of all was put forward by the Home Secretary who said, well, we did certainly have a, a law which said that you couldn't import the products of prison labour into Britain. But because these were labour camps and they didn't actually, weren't actually built of brick, they didn't really count as prisons. Um, I mean, you know, the mind, mind boggles. The Conservative Party did finally manage to get one debate into Parliament in 1931. They shoehorned it into a, a debate on the economy. And uh, the government, therefore, at that stage, were unable to resist having a public, um, a public uh, debate. Uh, and um, the responses by Labour politicians to the, the statement of what by now the whole country knew was evidence. It was a massive, massive scandal. It was in, the, in all the newspapers. The churches had organised uh, a day of prayer on behalf of suffering Russians, which was the biggest protest against Soviet communism in history until the late 1980s. Over a million people around the world joined it. Catholic cathedrals were, were full, tens of thousands in St. Peter's Square and all sorts of things. So, so we get to this debate. We have George Strauss MP, who later became father of the House, a Labour MP, um, saying that conditions in Soviet prisons were very much better than our own, uh, quite brazenly. And then the final statement, uh, there were many, many, and again, I detail these in the book, but the final statement came from the government spokesman, William Graham, who was the, uh, the trade minister and destined to be a future star of the party, but unfortunately he died of flu um, a, a short while later. And um, he, his, his verdict was that the... Now, we're talking, remember, these 1.8 million deportees, terrible conditions, slave labor. His verdict was that, and I'm quoting it as near enough word for word as I can remember, the Soviets are conducting a very interesting and remarkable social experiment, economic experiment, and they deserve to be allowed to continue without outside interference, and we will give them every support that we can. That about almost two million people in work camps. Utterly appalling. Uh, to my mind, one of the most shameful speeches that's ever been made in the House of Commons. It's an incredible level of, of moral compromise. It most certainly is. Moving forward to more recent times, apart from Diane Abbott um, saying on, on national TV that uh, Mao did more good than harm, um, it, it, do we see much of this kind of Soviet communism influence in the modern Labour Party? There was very much a division that took place after the war. 
and then a continued division with, with um, the inv Soviet invasion of Hungary and whatever. But um, there were labor intellectuals, uh, GDH Cole being one, who actually said that although it would cause the er eradication of many um, human rights that he personally valued, he would, and this is, I think he, this was during the war, he said this, uh, he wrote this, he would prefer Britain to be under the rule of Stalin for all that brutality, he used the word brutality, rather than run by a, 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 a pack of feeble social democrats. The most important thing was the eradication of the class system, whatever cost that was going to be in terms of the suspension of what we would call capitalist conceptions of human rights. An, an astonishing statement from somebody who became a mentor to future, uh, future prime ministers. Now, I say that because John MacDonald, who was going to be Chancellor of the Exchequer if Jeremy Corbyn had won the election, Jeremy, uh, uh, John MacDonald was questioned uh, way, way back when he was still nowhere near the public eye back in 2006 about what the key influences on his political uh, outlook were. And he said, well, Marx, Lenin and Trotsky. Uh, this resurfaced when he was a much more important politician and as we were heading towards general election and Jeremy Corbyn was riding the crest of a lot of um, uh, youthful support, certainly, uh, when confronted by it on TV, he said, no, I, I am a socialist. Well, we need, first of all, to remember what a socialist means to somebody who says that Marx, Lenin and Trotsky are his key influences. No, I'm a socialist, he said, more in the line of GDH Cole. Now, that's a wonderful um, smokescreen because nobody knows who GDH Cole is nowadays. But if you look back and see what GDH Cole was prepared to say and talk about the total suspension of uh, personal liberty in this country in order to be able to bring Stalin-style communism in, you actually realise that he hadn't changed at all. Um, lots of his other languages is, ha has been the same. Jeremy Corbyn um, was uh, very happy to be a lead speaker at the, um, at the celebration of the 200th anniversary of the publication of the Communist Manifesto, which, which, which runs through all these things like the abolition of, of, of private property. The abolition of the family is explicitly in there, um, uh, and so on and so on. The, the, the Communist Manifesto, when you actually read it, is not some nice little benign statement about everybody sharing things. Marx makes quite clear what his intentions are then and that the only way to be able to achieve the revolution is by the forceful overthrow of the state. So Jeremy Corbyn was happy to celebrate and be a key speaker at, an at, at, at a meeting uh, set up by the Communist Party of, of Britain. He then employed a 40-year-long uh, member of the Communist Party of Britain, Andrew Murray, as his special advisor. Now, it was claimed that Andrew Murray had left the Communist Party of Britain and become a Labour Party member. But you see in the ever interfighting uh, British far left that if anyone deserts their party, they are ostracised totally uh, and the knives are out and there are all sorts of uh, 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 all sorts of articles published against them and their declared heretics and what not a word of that when Andrew Murray came over and joined um, Jeremy Corbyn's team uh, and in fact then the Communist Party of Britain said that they were going to be putting their votes entirely behind a Jeremy Corbyn Labour Party. Communist Party of Britain's um, stated publicly available manifesto includes the total takeover of uh, every aspect of uh, production, distribution and exchange, um, estate agents, um, country houses, talks about going through the upper ranks of the police and the army and the judiciary in order to be able to uh, weed out all those who are hostile to the socialist revolution. I mean, mass purges, these are mass purges. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's student level idiocy, but you read through and it's quite astonishing that any adult human being can believe that. As a, they, they even talk about the prospect of retired generals coming out in counter-revolution and so therefore the people needed to be able to rise up, people's militia by then would have overtaken the army, in order to be able to fight this off. And this is the party 
of Andrew Murray, who was brought along as Jeremy Corbyn's special advisor. I mean, it, it doesn't take somebody of very limited intelligence to see the connections that there are there. And then when you have young Labour reading groups, as, as, as they did in, in twenty only in 2020, talking about the Communist Manifesto, which they were going to be studying as one of the most important um, political statements ever made, you realise that that part of the Labour Party, that part, and it's very important to say that part of the Labour Party, is still absolutely loyal to the principles that stand behind Marx and communist socialist revolution. However, that division, uh, which we've now seen has happened, um, is separating the main part of the Labour Party from that. We very nearly underwent a communist coup in this country. I don't think you could call it anything less, as you found that all the constituency parties were being taken over by Corbyn loyalists, by people who were previously in extreme parties which would have been banned from Labour Party membership, but now somehow I'd managed to leave those parties and join the Labour Party and whatever. Uh, we really dodged a bullet because I have no idea what the country would be like by now if, um, if they managed to get in. But fortunately, people woke up to what was really going on. Interestingly, it was really the anti-Semitism issue which alerted people to things not being quite right. Uh, they missed a lot of the other points. Uh, but nonetheless, the Labour Party now is moving away from that. How successful they'll be at doing that, I don't know. There are still Corbyn-type loyalists, I don't necessarily Corbyn loyalists, there are still extreme left-wing elements within the Labour Party. Uh, there are still fights going on in, in local constituencies, uh, and the left will, the hard left, will never go away. There are still plenty of people committed to this utopian philosophy that believes that somehow or other, one day, full communism, full brotherhood, heaven on earth is possible. Uh, it, just, it's completely illogical because it couldn't happen. And we haven't even gone into all the reasons why a collective economy is bound not only to crash, but also to be the route into a totalitarian dictatorship. That's a, a whole another subject. And, and Friedrich Hayek, one particular writer, is, is very, very good on that. And I mean, I would recommend anyone read uh, his, uh, his analysis of it. It's, it, it, it. it's very straightforward and very persuasive. You realise that, in fact, full socialism would lead to an end of truth, would lead to total, total censorship, uh, and uh, it, it is unachievable. You can't force people, uh, you can't take over a whole economy and then direct it from above unless people can be forced to move factories. If you want to build a factory, then you have to decide what jobs they're allowed to do. Someone wants to be a doctor. Sorry, we've got enough doctors this year. We only need plumbers. You're going to be a plumber. The labor, the labor force would start to be moved around like that, and anyone who dissented, of course, because they'd be rocking the boat, because they would be preventing the success of the economy, would have to be repressed. I mean, that's it in short. I'm taking a step back um, and, and looking at this from a wider view, if I went out onto the streets of London wearing a Nazi symbol, I would rightfully be heckled, um, um, told, you know, what, what, what am I doing? Because this ideology has killed six million people. If I went out and walked around wearing a communist symbol, there'd probably be a fair few people who, who think I'm kind of cool. But uh, as we discussed... They would do. Let, I mean, let's look at Europe, to, Europe as it is now. Uh, Spain, in 2021, issued a stamp with the hammer and sickle on it, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Spanish Communist Party. A national stamp. Their uh, deputy prime minister is a signed-up member of the Spanish Communist Party. So... Yes, there's certainly a uh, there's certainly a, a, a dissonance there. Uh, there are a number of reasons. Um, the first is that there was no liberation of gulag camps, the liberation of of Auschwitz, or the liberation of remember Auschwitz was an extermination camp. So, but the liberation of of labor camps, slave labor camps, um, took place in front of the world's photographers. Reporters were in there. Uh, the story was being told. There was a ready market for that story because we were near the end of the war. So there was all that publicity, whereas people who were discharged from the Gulag had to sign a paper saying that, that this, <laughs> their imprisonment 
was a state secret and that if ever they ever revealed it, they were liable to be imprisoned all over again. That fear remained within society to say nothing because, of course, the totalitarian control of the secret police continued. And there were moments of relaxation, um, the ability of, of Solzhenitsyn to publish his book on e e the life of Ivan Denisovich um, was one. But uh, we, never had, we never had a Nuremberg for communism. We never had a Nuremberg for communism, not my phrase, but it puts it, it, puts it very, very succinctly. Um, Willy Brandt's famous Niefel in, in front of the museum, in front of the, the monument, I think, in, in Warsaw, was a world, a world-making moment of national repentance. Um, and Germany has kept that mood within its public conversation. But nothing of that. We now have Putin um, uh, uh, restoring Stalin as if he wasn't restored. We have numerous debates within the West amongst communists who say, well, you know, that wasn't full communism. And you've got the Trotskyites, all of whom believe that Stalin basically betrayed the communist idea. Tr Trotsky, if you read his writings, was just as brutal and nasty as Stalin was. Um, so, so we have this discontinuation because of the nature of history and the way it's unfolded. We also have a complete public non-understanding of the nature of communism. I, it was Solzhenitsyn himself who said, socialism is such a woolly phrase, you can use it to apply to almost anything, and people do. I don't quote him exactly, but that's the, the, the sense of what he was saying. It, the, people think of communism and socialism as just sharing. Let's all be nice to each other, and let's all make sure we have an equitable distribution of wealth so that we have no poor and deprived in our society. Capitalists would say the easiest way to build that slack into the economy, to be able to do that, is through the market economy. However, it appeals very much to young people. I mean, you know, the, 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 the phrase we have today, if you're... Um, not a communist by the time you're 20, you've got no heart. If you still are by the time you're 30, you've got no brain. A kind of, kind of goes through the process. A lot of people have an early flirting with the idea of communism, which they don't understand. Uh, and then reality kicks in as they get older and as their brains develop and as their experience of human nature continues. Uh, but we have a massive educational issue ahead of us when only one-sixth of the British population I see recently actually think that Winston Churchill was a hero, a man who undoubtedly was a national hero. Every hero is flawed, but if you start to write your history from exceptions in each character, then you get a very, very distorted picture of history from exceptions in each series of events, <laughs> exceptions in 19th century and slavery. You can, you can build any argument you want to if, you, if, you, if you're really trying hard to, to shoehorn history into your political point of view. But we really, really do need education. This is why, in fact, the, when you say my book is new, that's the second edition, which we brought out just in the last year. But uh, the current book that I'm working on is actually a deep dive into the works of Marx, Lenin, uh, Trotsky, and Stalin, only using their own, uh, their own writings and some Soviet intellectuals of the 1920s as well, to try and make simple for ordinary people what it was that they wrote about, what their political program was and their ideas, what revolutionary communism look like as they saw it, because when you do actually go into the sources, and, you know, China has whole, whole universities dedicated to studying Marxism-Leninism, uh, the Soviet Union did for many years. But in the West, we really need to be able to get that message across. And so what I have been working on and writing on, I'm about 80% finished on, 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 on my, my, my work for it, is to be able to make those ideas clear to those who do not have uh, university or postgraduate level political education, are not Marx specialists, maybe small c conservatives 
who want a different and more sensible argument than, well, it killed 100 million, didn't it? Because, you know, in the end, someone just says no, and you haven't got any arguments left. Uh, and, and it's also written for people who are getting attracted to the idea of communism or socialism or any of the fringe parties which are Trotskyite or anything else that hang around British universities recruiting en masse. It's, it's for those people so that you can, can go to them and say, OK, you, through really good reasons, because you have a heart for social justice, think that this is the answer. But do you know that if you sign up to this philosophy, your founders said and believed this. Your founders rejoiced at the prospect of bloodshed. Your founders said that revolution was impossible without terror to enforce it, and that was the only way. Your founder, Marx, said violence was the midwife of, uh, of revolution. Um, I get the, the quote slightly wrong, uh, but, but he talks about violence as being the midwife. It's the means, it's the necessary means by which revolution can take place. Are you prepared to accept that? Are you prepared to accept that Marx said the family needs to be abolished, that uh, Lenin's wife and other senior officials talked about nationalizing children, taking the way, them away from the harmful effects of the family. Are you aware that uh, Marx dismissed the middle class family as bourgeois claptrap? Do you believe that? Do, are, you, are you an anti-family person? Are you an anti-private property person? Do you, do you believe, as Marx did, that the only way to get through to revolution was the total abolition of private property, because that's what he did. And if you're going to be a Marxist, a proper Marxist, and you're going to pride yourself that you understand what he said, do you agree with that? And if you don't agree with that, I mean, you know, with any philosophy, you have a founding father or some leading prophets, in this case, Marx and Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, uh, and Stalin on the end too, but, but really they were all there before Stalin. You have, you have your founding fathers, your inspirations, your prophets. If you commit yourself to following their set of beliefs, only then to discover that their beliefs were violent, nasty, anti-humanitarian, you're still going to follow the philosophy. Because the two things don't, don't, don't tie up. Not because, because most of the people who, who are interested in communism, as I say, they've got good hearts, they, they, they're going in the right direction, um, and it's the, it's the question they need to be confronted by, but they're never confronted until they're drawn in, well, they're never confronted, but they, they get drawn in to this lovely sense of community because human, human beings are naturally community orientated. So they're suddenly surrounded by a whole load of people who they feel at home with. We're all part of the great movement to build the new future, to build heaven on earth. Uh, they don't always use those words, but it is what it comes down to. We've got a purpose in our lives. And, and there's a great amount of... of, of there's a great amount of good feeling that, that is generated by that. But, you know, if you wanted to join the Nazi party in the, the, in the second half of the 1930s, you'd have got the same buzz out of being part of the Hitler Youth. And I think we probably accept that just because you've got a buzz out of being part of the Hitler Youth, it does not mean it was heading in the right direction or based on the right foundations. So. If our viewers want to find out more, where can they go? Well, um, I'm on Twitter, at Giles Udy. Uh, my book is on the second edition. First edition is, is, is out of print. The second edition is, uh, is available on Amazon. I have a website, gilesudy.com, where you can find me very easily. And, um, and actually, if there's any problem getting the book on Amazon, uh, I, I, I have copies available through there. Not much of a different price, I don't think. Giles Udy, thanks for joining us on British Thought Leaders. It's been my pleasure.